What is a pastor? Pastors teach him about God. He reads from the Bible. Okay, and then you. Oops. He talks about Jesus. Very good. Jesus perceived their thoughts. These guys are like, what? What did he just say? Your sins are forgiven you. That's blasphemy. Nobody can forgive sins but God. And he, he, he perceived that. So he says to them, he says, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, rise up and walk. Now, the guy's laying on a stretcher, man. He's paralyzed. Right? He's laying there on a stretcher. Which is easier? Huh? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Huh? I don't know about you. What if the guy don't get up? If he says your sins are forgiven you, right? Who knows? <laughs> You know, I grew up in the streets, uh, basically in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, come up in the streets there, it's, it was fast times, fast living. Um, I, uh, I probably experimented with every kind of drug there was out there. I was addicted to drugs um, uh, in my younger years. I was running in the streets and um, I was addicted to crack cocaine and uh, angel dust and, you know, uh, drinking. Uh, I had every kind of addiction, basically. Uh, that drugs has to offer. Um, my drug addiction did take me to the, I guess, my lowest point, my, my bottom. I was on a fast track to destruction. I ended up going to prison in New York City. Um, I ended up doing three years um, in, in the New York State Penitentiary. Which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or get up a walk? Now he knows, he knows that these people came here to see the show, mind you. He knows why they're there. They want to see magic. They want to see the healing perform. So he goes on to say, but did you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins? He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. I went through Rikers Island. I ended up in Clinton Danamora, um, which is a well-known uh, maximum security prison. I ended up being in there with um, people who were doing life. Um, so it wasn't an easy stay. It wasn't an easy prison to be in. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. They were filled with fear. They were scared. I witnessed all kinds of stuff in, in prison, and went through quite a bit of change. It was there that I met the Lord. It was there that I made a commitment to God that, um, that I would stop living that way. Oh, maybe this is God. What did we just see? What just happened? He, he did tell that guy, your sins are forgiven. But then he told him to get up and walk, and the guy did, he got up and walked. And this guy's been paralyzed for a long time. Yo, what's going on? They're scared. Fear fell on them. Maybe you say people that the fear fell on. Maybe they're saying in their hearts, if this is God, then, then, then he knows the truth about me. He knows what I'm doing. He knows I ain't right. I ain't correct. He knows I, 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 I was I, 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 He knows I was drinking the other day. I'm talking about the Pharisees and the scribes now. I'm talking about the, the religious leaders. Well, what about that prostitute I had the other night? Oh! says fear fell on him. He got scared. It was about three years ago the Lord told me um, that it was time to start the ministry. He woke me up in the middle of the night. Um, it was about four o'clock in the morning and he took me to the book of Isaiah chapter 47 and I in the book of Isaiah, I'm reading this, and uh, you know, it didn't quite make any sense to me. The, the ministry was women and children, and 
Uh, that's what that's what he was speaking to me through through the book of Isaiah. There was a gentleman that was uh, uh, just getting out of another ministry, and he had nowhere to live, so he came he came to live uh, at one of the houses I have in Port St. Lucie, and he wrote down the vision that the Lord gave me. He wrote it, um, and in the vision, you know, it exclaimed, uh, you know, the Lord was basically showing me everything that He wanted me to do. Um, and at that time, an opening opened up at the jail, and um, uh, the Lord told me to go. Um, so I started going into the into the jail at Rock Road, and um, I started, you know, preaching the gospel in, in, in the spiritual dorm and in the drug and alcohol dorm. And as I'm there, the guy started asking me, do you have a house? Do you have a, a program? And I'm like, no, no, I don't have a house. No, I don't have a program. Um, and one night I left out of the jail, and I felt, um, I felt compassion on, on one of these guys that had asked me. So on my way home, I, I, I started to speak to the Lord. I was like, Lord, am I supposed to get a house? Am I supposed to do this? Is this what you want me to do? He says, yeah, get a house. We had a thrift store, and this was supposed to be the start of the ministry. It's in the mission statement um, that the Lord would provide through, through a small thrift store. Um, uh, this, this, greater, uh, this greater ministry would, would, would explode and come from it. You know, One of the ways the Lord um, has provided for our ministry to support our ministry because we're fully self-supported. Um, you know, God supplies all our needs. Um, is is through the thrift store. People will donate, um, you know, used furniture and things that they don't want anymore, and then we would resell them. You know, and we also use this tool, you know, to help people that don't have anything. A lot of times we'll, you know, give uh, give furniture away to help uh, like single mothers with children. Um, but the Lord has used this uh, as a, a huge blessing. We've even created an eBay store. Through that vision um, that the Lord had given me for the ministry, he had showed me these things. He had showed me um, that it would come from a thrift store um, and that it would be for women and children. And at the time, I was a little confused because in the jail, there was no women and children. There was men. So um, it began, like I said, with a thrift store. And right about uh, January uh, 2012, uh, we got our first men's program, our first men's house. Uh, we had men coming out of the jail, and, and they started living there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had a steady trust the Lord. And I'm asking them, you know, at the time, I'm like, Lord, you know, this is a men's house. You know, wh wh what are we doing? Are we doing a men's program, a men's shelter? Or are we helping men? I thought it was women and children. You know, and then he, he gave me a greater understanding uh, of, of the widow and, 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 and the orphan, you know, that, that, that everybody's a widow and everybody's an orphan. Even men can be a widow and an orphan because uh, it had really nothing to do with the way people look at it. A widow and orphan, you automatically think of a woman and a child, but the greater understanding, once he showed it to me spiritually, that anybody can be a widow um, who God has died in their life. Um, is that one time they're married to God and then all of a sudden now they become a widow because you know God is so far away from them because they've walked so far away from the Lord that he's now dead. Who is Jesus? Me. You first. <coughs> he's um, God. The Jesus. Lord. Very good. The Lord. The Spirit. He is a spirit. You know, I had some money and um, I, I, I used all the money the way he told me to use it. You know, he directed my paths. He told me, rent this place, open up the store, rent this house, sign a year lease. So everything that he told me to do, I just continued to follow one step at a time. Um, and then I ran out of money, you know, and, 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 and then it got kind of, 
it got kind of scary um, in my own, you know, I mean, in my flesh, you know. What has Good Samaritan Ministries or Vito done to help you? Well, first of all, it's all, glory to all to God, first of all. But Pastor Vito, I met Pastor Vito at um, New Horizons. Someone gave me his number. He came and interviewed me. And the first thing he asked me was, um, did I accept um, Jesus Christ as my savior? You know, and I told him, yeah, you know, and he said, I'll take you. But I had rough times at the program. I didn't get it right the first time, but but he believed in grace. So when I got when I left the program and then I came back to him, he gave me an opportunity to come back to the program again, you know. And then I got left again. I left like at least six, seven times, but he always showed me grace. Like God would show us, you know what I'm saying? But he gave me a place to stay, you know, he, he gave me work, you know. He done done a lot for other people too, like the food pantry that we have. A lot, a lot goes on around here at Good Samaritan, you know. It's like he, he taught me, you know, it's all about helping others. Because God say love thy neighbor. That's one of the, ma the main commandments in the Bible is love thy neighbor. And he showed me and teach me that, you know. And it's been a blessing to me considering where I come from. I come from Fort Pierce, it's like a rough town, you know. And I was always surrounded by people that's getting high. Not saying that they got me, they made me get high, but that's what I was surrounded by. So that's what I um, really turned to, you know what I'm saying, getting high. I ended up going to prison two times, you know, I'd have been in and out of um, psych wards, you know. I've been homeless for like six months before I met him. He basically gave me a place to stay. He basically gave me a new life. It's really not that hard, is it, Joe? We can make it hard though, right? We're all worst enemies sometimes, right, Joe? Joe, you're doing different. You're doing it different this time. For some reason, something happened. I don't know. You know? How many times have you been here, Joe? Five, six, seven. You probably got more chances than anybody. Right? But look, you know what? The Lord don't give up on people. My wife tells me I'm crazy. Because she can't do that. She can't. And she'll admit it openly. Once somebody crosses the line, that's it. Done. She doesn't know how I can do it. And I can't do it. Listen to me. I can't do it. Unless it was Jesus Christ, I can't do it. But Jesus don't give up on you, man. You don't. You're worth it. You're worth it to him. The sinner. The no good. You understand? The the the, the, the prostitute, the drunk, the, the drug addict, the thief, the tax collector. All the same. Sin is sin. He don't care. See what I'm saying? Come as y'all. Come and surrender. Surrender. Give it to the Lord. I have a ministry, and I don't know where my where where am I getting the money? Where am I getting the money to pay the electric? Where am I getting the money to pay the rent? Where am I getting? I had nothing, you know. And um, so I did have properties. I had properties, and I was renting the properties, and the rents were generally used to pay the mortgages. You know, they they were self sustained. They paid for themselves, so I didn't have to worry about that. But then I heard the Lord say, um, "Use the rent money." And I kind of got confused. I was like, well, if I don't pay the mortgage, I'll lose the property. And then I heard the Lord say, do you trust me? And I said, of course I trust you, Lord. Use the money. Use the rent. And I was using the money to help support the ministry. Um, and it wasn't like for a little bit of time. It was probably 10 months, 12 months of not paying the mortgage. So naturally, these properties all went to foreclosure. And I'm like, Lord, what now? You know, um, do you trust me? <laughs> Heard it again. Yeah, I trust you. My wife and my daughter live in the house that we have on uh, Floresta. My daughter's lived there for five years now. And, you know, my wife is concerned that we're going to lose the house. And do you trust me? I hear it again, you know. So I continued to just walk in faith and I just continued to trust the Lord. There was no outside contributions. There was no government money, there was no grants, there was nothing. There was nothing to help the ministry. And by this time, we've already established the second men's house. Um, so the ministry was growing, um, needless to say. Um, and um, so the expenses were getting higher, but the income was, was, was getting lower. This is one of the, the men's houses in Good Samaritan Ministries. Uh, there's four men's houses, four women's houses. Um, so this is Sunday night right now. We usually come together in the evenings, you know, each house individually, and we pray. We have prayer Sunday nights, and uh, afterwards we, we eat dinner together as a family, 
you know, we get the family thing going. And a lot of these guys come out of jail or prison or off the streets and, you know, Good Samaritan, they're, they, don't, they don't discriminate, you know. They feel everyone deserves a chance and, you know, doors are open to anybody pretty much, you know. And, there's been people here that have had some really rough lives and, you know. I guess for me, Good Samaritan, they've uh, they pretty much saved my life. They, you know, when my family had nothing to do with me, they, Pastor Vito took me in. You know, even after he knew I just tried to kill myself. And, you know, uh, it's been a lot of ups and downs. Clean and sober a year and a half now. And that's the longest stretch in uh, 28 year binge of doing drugs that I've been that clean and sober. It's a place to save my life. And, Glory to God for that. Before my incarceration, I was out on the streets for about four months um, with, with a serious crack addiction. Um, lost my wife, lost my son, um, lost a home that we were living in. Um, all the personal, you know, little things that we all try to look forward to or try to build up throughout the life. Um, everything, you know. What I mean, when I went to jail, my family was has has walked away. Um, wouldn't answer the phones, wouldn't uh, visit. And so for the last six months that I was incarcerated, I sat in jail asking the Lord what it is that He wanted me to do. I know coming out of jail, coming here in the last week, that I've seen numerous miracles throughout each one of us. In my life, just in this last week, um, not only am I out of jail and I'm able to spend Thanksgiving with other people um, that, are, that are proud and, and, and happy to uh, to praise and give worship to the Lord, but um, I'm able to see my, fam my, my wife and my son. Um, I got to see my son the first time uh, in eight months the other day, so that was, that was a blessing itself, you know. Um, and it's something that I've been praying over, you know. My wife filed for divorce when I went into jail. Right now, I didn't think I'd be where I'm at right now. Um, I didn't think that, I figured my next stop was, was prison, you know. I, as far as I was concerned, where I was at at the time, we've been, you know, coming together um, as one, have been able to help each other out, and I know for me it's been a blessing. I found myself today in a very uh, harmful situation, one that I knew that was going to uh, lead to no good in my life, and I called Pastor Vito on the phone, and he uh, sent one of the guys in the ministry right over to pick me up at the house I was staying at. You know, and I, I knew that if I stayed in the situation that I was in, that it was going to lead to big trouble for me. And, you know, I'm grateful that, you know, just making a phone call to Pastor Vito, he invited me back here, no questions asked. You know, and, and I know that, uh, you know, when I had that come over me, that I, I have to get out of here and at the place I was staying, you know, and the first person I thought of was to call Pastor Vito. I didn't know what he was going to say, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm grateful you know, through the Lord that he's led me back here. Now, I know a lot of the guys here from the last time I was here, and, uh, you know, they, they welcome me with open arms, and I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. Good Samaritan saved my life. I mean, pretty much everyone in here, I would say Good Samaritan saved their life. Um, it's also saved my soul, you know what I mean? I was an atheist and agnostic, and I was scared of God. I was here for four or five months and still denied it, fought it, did everything I could to deny it, left. Um, Broke Vito, Pastor Vito's trust while I was here. I, I uh, did everything I wasn't supposed to do the first time I was here, and I left and uh, went right back to, to where I was, you know, before I came the first time to an even worse place, a much worse place actually. And uh, and then I called Pastor Vito out of the blue and uh, you know told him I was out, I was out there on the streets killing myself and I needed I needed him to help me. And just like uh, you know Richard said, it was the same thing. 15 minutes later, there was a van there for me. And they brought me in, and uh, <clears throat> and for some reason, uh, my eyes were open when I came back this time, and I was able to see God in this program, in my life, and the miracles He was doing for so many people. And uh, you know, and I was saved. Not just my life, my soul got saved here through, through Good Samaritan and Pastor Vito. And anyone who doesn't see that the Lord is working through Pastor Vito that has their eyes closed. And, uh, and that's it. That's what they've done for me. I was addicted to painkillers, and I was doing cocaine, and uh, you know, I wasn't living godly at all. In fact, I was living like there was no God, you know, and, and finally I hit my bottom in my life, and 
I needed something else. You know, I struggled with it, but finally I just got broken enough to, to really give in, you know, and I humbled myself and, you know, I called the pastor and I asked him if, you know, I told him I had two kids and, and my fiance, you know, I said, but I didn't have any money. And he said, Clay, it's not about the money. He's like, when can you come, you know? And that felt really good because, you know, a lot of places, all they, all they want is money. You know, that's what everything's based on. And, you know, I came here, I was deto detoxing off of opiates. And, you know, it was rough for the first few days. I'd say about a week, I really went through bad detoxes. But they were there for me and they, they helped me out, you know. And ever since then, like, I was been reading the word and just really having spending fellowship time with God and God's just really changed my life. He you know, he took me from that dark pit that I was in and he put my feet on solid ground. My whole life, my family and people that I knew in my past, they always gave up on me. But you know, the ministry and Pastor Vito, they really believed in me and that's what helps me, you know, that's what gives me strength. Um I can remember we were in that ministry and there was nothing to eat for these guys, you know. Um, they were splitting like a can of corn. Um, and then someone, you know, come to service and they told us about a food bank and we can start a food pantry. Now the Lord showed me that. The Lord showed me that we'd have a food pantry. I didn't know how to start a food pantry. I didn't even know what, where to begin. By August, the food pantry was established. Um, so this August just made two years that we've had the food pantry open. Um, and we feed the public. We feed uh, between 150 to 200 families every single week. Um, and it's fully self-sustained, it's fully self-supported. The Lord brings the money in. Still to this day, we're going in our third year. We haven't gotten a grant. We have no government money, government money, no no state money. This is the Good Samaritan food boxes. Every Wednesday, preparing food for people who don't have food. Every Wednesday from one to five, so we welcome you to join. My name is Jamar Watts Kiefer. My name is Antonio Porti. Today's a Wednesday and there's a food pantry here every Wednesday for Good Samaritan. The people that don't get food for the needy, that people don't have food to get money to get food, they're here. All these cars are people that come here from the, for the food pantry. And my job is a car, car traffic director. I tell cars where to park and, and stuff like that. And my job is to carry the boxes to the car. You know, you want to say something to saw uh, this pantry's going yeah, to be Yeah, it's good that they're helping out the veterans, that's all. Uh, and here we are in our third year. The Lord has managed to work it out where it's pretty neat. We, we, we have a little church service while they're waiting to get their food. And so we get to feed them spiritually and physically. Uh, but then before I know it, um, we're opening up a woman's house. And our first woman's house opened up. And now it was for women. It was a women's shelter for anything. You know, most of these places, you hear about them, they'll take a pregnant woman on drugs, or they'll take a woman uh, who's been batted, or there's stipulations, you know, and it, it just didn't fit for every case, you know. There was nothing that, okay, anybody could come. You know, women had different cases, different circumstances, but they all had the same thing in common. They were broken. You know, they were, they were hurt, you know, uh, just like the men. You know, if you come here, you're broken, right? For the most part, people come in, they're broken. They, you know, they ain't got nothing going on. Something's messed up. But you get here and you meet Jesus. And Jesus is here. Jesus is in the house. It's a matter of, do you want to tap in? Do you want to tap in to the supernatural? To the Spirit of God? So we have all different kinds of women coming in, and that's the that's the good part about the neat part about this ministry. Is we take all different women. We take women out of jail. We take women out of out of New Horizons. We take women that are homeless in the street. Um, we currently have like three or four women with their children that were homeless. Some have older children. Some have younger children. All the stories are different. We have women who have DCF cases who don't have their kids, and they're trying to follow a case plan so they can be reunited with their children. I want you ladies to know that this is the girl that God used for the women's house. She's the first woman that ever came through this program with her child and, and the whole DCF thing. Uh, now we have like bundles of them, all right, that we're dealing with with DCF. But her, her child, her child was on the brink of adoption. She was at the last straw, okay? But Jen walked 
the course that she needed to do all, and, and she did what she needed to do. And instead of her daughter being adopted, <coughs> she was given back off. And her and her daughter lived with me and my wife for probably about 10 months, right? And today, her daughter is with her, and they're still doing good. Praise God. Yeah. So, I'm glad you guys are here tonight because you're a testimony. And you're both wearing black. That's good. See, me and my wife, we're wearing, we're wearing peach. And my daughter. We wear, we like color match. We learned that from Bonnie. Amen. So, God's opened up the door to so many different avenues so many different women uh, that we could help in this ministry. When we opened up the door to women, now we opened up the door to couples. Men go to the men's houses, women go to the women's houses with the children. We currently have four women's houses. The women are rapidly gaining on the, on the men. Uh, I think we're up to 28 women. And uh, we have somewhere around 33, 35 guys, um, plus about 14 or 15 children. I came here from Arizona uh, back in June. I was really struggling with addiction. I've been using for over 13 years now, and I really needed help. I fell hard, and I fell on my face. And I remember crying, praying to God to please help me, please help me get clean, but don't send me back to jail. Don't send me back to prison to get clean. And the next morning I woke up, and I had a phone call from my dad asking me if I wanted to go to Florida for vacation. So I got excited. I said, yes, this is my chance to get clean. Packed up a bag for the weekend, and I came down to Florida to visit with my two brothers for Father's Day weekend. It was Sunday night, Father's Day. We stopped by Pastor Vito's house, and my brother was in the program. He graduated you know, almost, almost three years ago when there was only five men in the program, and now the program has expanded so much with all the women and children. And Pastor Vito asked me, when I go back to Arizona, what am I going to do? What's my plan? I didn't have a plan. He said, why don't you stay? Why don't you come to the women's house and stay in our program? So I, I said, okay. With my luggage that I had, I came. And I've been here ever since. So in the last six months, a lot has changed. I thought just getting clean was my main problem. But there was a lot to learn about life and the true way of living, you know, knowing God. And it's amazing what I've learned and what has been taught to me throughout this ministry. And I'm, I'm so grateful for it. It's amazing the friendships that I've built here with my sisters in Christ. The leaders that are here, it's truly amazing throughout the world and being out there. You know, I didn't have many friends that I could actually call friends. And I, here I have a family, a huge family. And I'm so grateful and blessed. I'm so grateful and blessed for it. I fell in love with the heart of this ministry. We also have had many trials in the time that we have lived here, but they have helped us overcome them. And for me, the verse that fits our season here is that God takes the lonely and places them in families. Because before we moved here, we were very much alone and lonely. And I have no parents, and my daughter has no grandparents or aunts or uncles, or we have no family at all to speak of. So. When we moved here, we inherited a whole family, a whole church family. My daughter is so loved, and um, we have been through trials here, and the, the, the family here has lifted us up in prayer, lifted her up in prayer. She was just in the hospital for a week, and we did not even know why or what was wrong. And everyone here in the ministry prayed faithfully, and now she is home. And I love this ministry. I love the pastor. I love the heart of it, and the Holy Spirit is so present here. I found out about Good Samaritan Ministries uh, last November 19th. I was in jail and confinement, and uh, I was broken, and um, I was on the verge of dying, whether it was killing myself through my own addiction or through other ways uh, and I was in confinement and I started getting close to the Lord and I it was right after Thanksgiving I got rid of all the secular books all the secular music and um, I was really lonely because in confinement you can't call family you can't you know and I was calling out to God and I was crying and I just happened
happened to put on the radio and no station would come in except 89.9 and so I turned it on and I hear this New Yorker voice and he's talking about how they handed out a bunch of food to the homeless and that drew me right there and then um, a guy named Josh said I just got out of jail and I came here and then a girl Talisha was talking about how she was living on the streets and I was like where is this place you know December 15th I called and I came right after I was released um, I was basically ROR'd uh, so I, I knew I had to go back to court I came and I did the intake and I was like okay <laughs> this is not for me <laughs> and so I left and I told Sarah I will be back in a month and January 31st I came back I, I went out to see what the world because I felt like I still needed to see what was out there and I was broken um, I was pregnant at the time and I had a miscarriage so I fell hard into my addiction and I called Sarah and I was in Sebring and I said Sarah do you remember me and she's like yeah I said I'm in Sebring and I can I come back and she said if you make it here then yes and I've been here ever since um, I've had a lot of trials since I've been here I had to go back to jail uh, for 21 days to finish out my sentence and it was the first time in my life that I was sober going to jail and uh, it was eye-opening to see all the people I used to run around with, sell with, and, and just be in that lifestyle. And, uh, you know, I've had my ups and downs here, but I can tell you what, anytime I fall, I get back up through the love of Christ and through the love of Pastor Vito, the leadership, all, all the people here. And it's a blessing to be here. It saved my life. This was my lifeline to God. A lot of these treatment centers and programs around, you know, they have insurance and they have counseling and they have all these, you know, professionals that come in. You know, with us, it's like basically we have no counselors. We have no, you know, uh, paid staff, you know. Basically, all we have is, um, you know, prayer. We rely on, on the power of prayer. We rely on, the, on, on each other. And, of course, we rely on Jesus. I thank you, God, for your love and your mercy and your grace on your people, Father. I thank you for the compassion and the patience that you have for us. I thank you for the power that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the healing that's in the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord. I thank you for the forgiveness that's in the blood of Jesus Christ, Father. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this ministry, Lord. I thank you for this ministry, Father. Lord, that my children can be with me, God. Lord, that I can be a father to my kids. Lord, and be aware, Lord, and see them and watch them grow up, God. I thank you for your, prov your provisions, Lord, and in all the houses, Father God, that you're our provider, Father, that we can call to you and you provide, Lord, that we ask and you answer, and we thank you for this, Lord. We just thank you for your mercy on us every day, Lord. We thank you for waking us up. And we thank you, God, for the women here and the men here. Lord, you're amazing. Father, and I'm nothing without you, Lord. Or that if I if I make a wrong decision, that I can come to you, God, and ask for forgiveness, and you and you promise forgiveness to me, God. Lord, I just thank you for this ministry, Lord. I thank you for the truth that's in your word, and I thank you how it's being revealed to us, Father God. I just ask that you bless all the women here and all the men here, Father God. Just give us comfort and peace, and, and the peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity that, that we have to come together, Lord, and get into your word and to learn about you, Father. We thank you for your love, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord, I just thank you for all the things you're doing, the things you've done, and all the things you're going to do, Lord. If I had a million tongues, I couldn't thank you enough, Lord. Lord, and I just come to you, and I just praise you, and I glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. 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 It doesn't matter, you know, men, women, children. Uh, I've learned that these, these, these people are broken. They just need somebody to tell them that Jesus loves them, you know, that Jesus is, is real and he's alive. We had a gentleman come from Detroit and he was coming to prophesy and to pray over the ministry. And we were having, uh, we didn't have a church set up or nothing like that. 
we had a thrift store. So he's like, well, can we have church? And I said, yeah, we can have church. And he was like, well, where we have it? I said, in the thrift store. We'll just have church in the thrift store. So uh, we, we moved all the clothes racks to the side and we kind of set it up and we hooked up a mic and we had a radio and we had, you know, praise and worship and the Spirit of God hit that place like a ton of bricks. A revival broke out and people were coming from all over and um, we started having church every night. And that was in February 2012. Um, and that was three years ago. Uh, this February makes three years. We moved from being in the thrift store on uh, US 1 there on Village Green Drive. So we moved our location. We have a new building now. Um, and we're having service. We actually have a church set up. And we're in the process of having the thrift store set up. Um, and now we're currently on Business Park Drive. But I have to tell you that we haven't stopped having church every night. Um, it, it, the Lord took that beginning and he developed it into having church every night for the people that come into this ministry. The most important thing for these people is to get the Word of God inside of them, um, to be taught the Word of God, and, and to be taught that, that they're not so bad, that God loves them, you know, that he forgives them, you know, uh, just the way he did with me. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why you hang out with these guys, Jesus? These are the scribes and the Pharisees. It's almost like, if I had to describe this to anything, this verse right here, this verse in scripture, what I would best sum it up to is how I've heard over and over from other churches. Why do I do what I do here? Pharisees and scribes, right? Telling Jesus, why do you whine and dine? Why do you eat and hang out? You got these kind of people! Well, he's a pastor. I got to honor him because he's a man of God. Why is he hanging out with them people? They're sinners. Why does he want to preach the gospel to them? Am I making any sense to you tonight? Because this is real. This is real. This is, in, this is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. We're in chapter 5 tonight. All right? This is real. What I'm saying to you, I hear it. The mayor came to my office today, sat down with me, and said, a pastor's wife said thus, then thus, and thus. And then said that. She don't respect me, and she don't respect what I do. And not only that, but a lot of pastors around <laughs> don't respect me because of the kind of ministry I have. Because I'm in this ministry, because I'm trying to help you. So you want your answer? How come nobody's helping? There you go. I guess people just don't care. Because you know, because they got God. They got God. That's why. I don't want their God. I don't want their God. Because that ain't God. This is God right here. We're reading it tonight. This is God. This is the God that we serve. Okay? He forgives the sinner. As a matter of fact, he calls the sinner to repent. And he said it. He said, I, I didn't come here to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. You know what that means? It's simple. Repent. Just repent. Stop sinning. Repent. It's over with. You're sorry. Sin no more. Sin no more. <laughs> they don't respect me. They don't respect Because of what I do. What do you do help other people? Because I help. Sinners. Because I help the worst people. No! No, we're not, Mike! Not the people in them churches. They're, not, they're, they're without sin. Oh, never mind. What's the matter with you? Ain't you never been to one of them churches? Yeah, I have. You know what? I date Jesus, man. I do. And I'll hang out with the sinners any day of the week. You know, I, I feel that, um, you know, the persecution that we, 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 we um, go through um, in our ministry uh, alone is, you know, it's, it's generally, you know, talk from, from the outside. A lot of 
a lot of people talk. Where do they get their money from? And, you know, oh, they're probably selling drugs, or they're probably doing this, or they're probably doing that. That's a form of persecution. That's a, you know, and, and it's a big form of persecution because to the other Christians, oh, we don't want to be around them. It automatically, you know, dilutes what we do there, you know, and, and what we stand for, you know, and, and the love of Christ that we have inside our ministry. If these people would perceive, if they had eyes to see and ears to hear, if they would perceive what this message is saying right here, this scripture about Levi, the tax collector, if they would just understand what Jesus is saying to them, all right, just by his apostles, just by the rest of the guys he took, all right, he's saying, you know what? You're all the same, man. Even though you're a fisherman and you work hard all night and catch nothing, and he's a tax collector and he works all day and takes taxes. You ain't that. You ain't no better than him. Huh? He ain't no better than you. I love you both. That's what he said. He said, I love you just the way you are. <clears throat> you know? Follow me. Let's just lay it all down. Forsake it all. You know, leave it. The fishermen left what they were doing, and that left, left, left what he was doing, right? So now they're both following Jesus, right? Who's better than who? And who's worse than who? You all get what I'm saying? Yes. The equal. Jesus didn't treat nobody better. They followed him the same. All the persecutions that you know, we've gone through is, you know, people that have come in and they haven't made it, they'll go back out into the street and then they'll start talking about the ministry. They'll call it a cult or they'll 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 say bad things about me or they'll say thing, bad things about the ministry. Um, you know, and generally they're trying to, you know, just brainwash people, try to get them to come back out, you know, and join them because uh, they're back out in the world and they're back out in the street. Persecution um, is, is, is welcome, though, in, in the house of the Lord. Um, the word says clearly that he was persecuted. Jesus said he was persecuted before us so that we will be persecuted and we have to we have to um, maintain and we have to withstand it. Uh, we have to count it all joy, actually, um, is what he says in James. Count it all joy when you're persecuted. Um, so we're, we're, we're really we're told to be happy about it. We're, happy, we're supposed to be happy when we're persecuted, when these things come, when the attacks come against us. It's more or less that um, you know God's working, you know God's moving inside the church. I truly believe not to put God in a box, you know, to let God have free reign. Um, so we do things differently in our church, you know. Uh, we all get there uh, for 7, 7.30, we gather, we fellowship a little bit. The children know we're having church. They want to participate. Our Father, from earth in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Don't us from evil. Amen. Very good, man. You did a great job. In the heavens, I can imagine that God is sitting there looking at this and he's saying, you know, these are the ones, these are the people that, the lost, you know, these are the ones that are suffering, you know, the broken. These are the ones that, that I came, you know, to bring to my kingdom, you know, these are the ones. I thank you, Father God, for expanding this congregation. I thank you for the new people that you're bringing in every day, Lord. I thank you for the blessings of houses and providing every day for this ministry because you know our needs, Lord, and not just what we want. I ask that 
you just bless us with a good praise and worship, Lord. That there be no distractions. That, that that spirit of distraction just goes, Lord. It's not welcome here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, some 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 churches. Uh,
Would you help today? Who woke up? Uh, who woke up at uh, before five a.m. this morning? Before five. Who woke up at six? Who woke up at seven? Who woke up at eight? Who woke up at nine? Ten. All right, so everybody was up by at least seven, eight o'clock, right? But listen, everybody woke up, right? Yep. Everybody woke up today. Praise God. Imagine if we just kept it simple. Just like that. We got up today. We're breathing. Anybody stick a ring in their arm today? Anybody? Anybody stick a ring in their arm? Anybody have a crack pipe in their pocket? Anybody got a fresh fresh gate? Glass? Nobody? Nobody's holding out? Any pills? Anybody got any pills? Um? Anybody do any pills today? Anybody drink? Any drinkers in the audience? Nobody? Nobody drank today? It's not a bad day. Right? Amen. Not a bad day. Nobody went to jail. Wow. Just the small things. Just start out with that. Small things. A lot of people want to be here. They, they, they have nothing. They've lost everything. They're broken. So they come in that way and they come in voluntarily. They want to be a part of the ministry. They want to get closer to the Lord. Then we have our cases where, where people are probated by the judges and the courts. Basically, when someone comes here on probation, they still have to comply with their probation every month. They have to go to, to groups if they schedule them to go to groups. Um, they have to pay probation once a month. They have to get a job. They have to live in an address. They have to pass drug screening there, drug tests that they give them. We as well give them drug tests. Uh, rather than stay in prison or go to jail or stay in jail, the judge will let them out and they'll um, probate them, let's say. They'll, they'll be put on probation. Part of their stipulation of probation, they have to do six months in, in Good Samaritan or a year in Good Samaritan. Uh, these are the people that really don't want to be there, but are forced to be there. Um, and so I, I see a lot of resistance in that area. The enemy is very, very wise to that. He knows when there's resistance, those are the ones who keep control. Um, also, um, I've seen them come in resisting and I've seen transformation in those people as well. I've seen them turn and when their probation is up and they're done, they're still around, they're still here, they're still coming back. So, you know, I've seen all kinds of things in this ministry so far. People that come to us on probation, they, they generally go through probation and they, and they, and they complete it. Um, they at least complete their probation. So, and they also get a, a seed sowed in them uh, that Jesus is, uh, is real and that he loves them. Joe, how are you today, Joe? You beat anybody up today? I can't. You got a brace on and crutches. What a joke. <laughs> this is like, this is the illest place, boy, I tell you what. I see some funny stuff going on here. All these gangsters, and the next thing you know, they got they got foot braces. Oh, this hurts, that hurts. George, George, let me see your hand, George. <laughs> yeah, we got your script. George came back from the hospital. He wrote in the prescription part, 50 blues. <laughs> He wrote his own prescription. Nice. I mean, it's crazy. It really is crazy. You know what? That's the kind of stuff that gets me through the day. Oh, I laugh at stuff like that. George, George I, I told George, I said, George, you're going to the hospital? Do not let me find out you get a prescription and, and, and you, you fill it. So I send him, um, I send him, um, uh, Greg with him, right? And Greg says, Pez Vito, you want me to call you if he, if he takes off of the script? <laughs> All serious. Like, Greg was like, really on the job. I said, yeah, Greg, call me. <laughs> George been known to do that now. Fill the script, and, you know. Yeah. Flip the script, I should say, right? Praise, Praise the Lord. Been a while now, huh, George? Good, good. They were doing good. Who got high over the weekend? Anybody? <laughs> like they would tell me. I got to catch them. It's a, it's a precious ministry, you know. Although it can be very frustrating sometimes, um, uh, it can be very hurtful. Uh, you know, I have to really separate my emotions from my spirit. 
it's amazing people come here, right, from whatever situation that they're coming here in, right? And then they're here a little while, and they forget all about where they came from. And then they start complaining about this place, and they come complaining about what's going on here, and how bad it is. And how it's, it's like this, and how it's like that. And could you imagine? They forgot the obvious. They forgot what's right in front of them. They're not living in the street no more. They're not in jail no more. They're not in New Horizons no more. There is a hot shower. Does everybody got food in the refrigerator at home? Yep. Every refrigerator full? Huh? They got food. Is there mattresses on all the beds in the houses? I'm just curious. Is there mattress? Is there sheets on the mattresses? Get out of here. Phyllis? Amazing. It's making me scratch my head like I don't understand it then. What more do we need? What more do we need? I know what it is. See, people, people get clean. They get clean for a couple of months and they forget where they came from. So it's like, you know, I don't need this no more. And then they start finding fault with the place that took them in when they had nothing. Right? Took them in and set them on, set them on, a, on the rock. Because it, it ain't me. It ain't me. And trust me, I'm not doing it. I have nothing to do with it. Right? You know, you get, you get here, you meet Jesus Christ, right? You put your feet on solid ground, all right? And you start to walk a little bit. And what happens? What happens? You get prideful, right? Then, you know, because pride comes with that misery. Misery is pride. That's all it is. And you know what the Bible says? It says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Imagine if we were just humble. Well, why do I got to follow the rules, Pastor Vito? Why do I got to call in? Why do I got to tell people where I'm going? I'm the bad guy all the time. Just let me tell you, I'm the bad guy. I know it. Because I'm the one that has to change the rules. I'm the one that has to make it harder for you, right, to try to help you. You love people. You love them with the heart of Christ. And, you know, and then they fail or, or they'll go back out or they'll leave. And some people leave on bad terms. And, you know, that could be very frustrating. And then I hear some crap like, you know, he's a control freak, he's trying to control us. You know, he don't really care. He's a control freak. Control what? I ain't got no control, get out. Leave. Look at Michael Hughes, how much control I got over him. Last night, he packed his bag and walked out the door. How much control is that? It's a choice. To be here is a choice. If you want to be here, you don't want to be here. Make a choice, make a decision. Sir, we still got diapers and all this? What size is? We got it. We got diapers. For all you that wants to keep complaining, we got diapers, we got tampons, we got all that. Depends. Yeah. It's ridiculous, man. What I got to hear on one day. One single day what I got to hear. What's going on. If people would just be about the Lord's business, you know what? There wouldn't be no time to complain. If people would pick up the Bible and really understand what it says inside of it, there won't be time to complain. There'll be some gratitude. People will be grateful. I'm tired, man. I'm tired of complaining. I'm not going weary and well-doing. That'll never happen. Because the Lord renews my strength. But listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying to you tonight. I'm tired. I am really tired of complaining. I'm tired of people doing whatever they want to do and, and, and not, you know, not submitting. Not submitting, you know, to the structure, to the program. All right? And doing what they need to do. I'm tired of it. When you see so much potential in somebody, um, if they would just surrender to the Lord, you know, if they would surrender to Jesus, um, what their life could be, you know, and then, you know, the enemy comes and steals them right from, uh, right from underneath your grip. And, uh, you know, then they're back out there, you know. But, you know, I believe God has a plan. God has uh, everything under control. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a lot of work, you know. Sometimes, sometimes I got to push through, you know. Sometimes I don't even want to. I don't even want to do it. I want to, I want to not show up, you know. Um, but I know that um, I can't do that. I have to be there. I have to be there every night. We have um, the, these two young kids, uh, young gentlemen. Uh, their mother has uh, MS, and they were living in an apartment in Fort Pierce, and they got robbed, and um, you know they were being mistreated, and um, they ended up uh, being uh, sent over to our ministry. 
So they've been here a couple of months, and uh, these two kids come in. They're only uh, 16 and 17. Uh, um, and I, I watched them. I, wa I watched the transformation in these two kids. You know, I watched them, um, you know, be so uh, in, in, engaged in his computer and both of both the boys. Um, and, you know, um, we had to take the computer away from them. And, you know, at first they didn't want nothing to do with church. And, and I watched the transformation. I watched him come up now, and he, he'll pray and... You know, just to see the, just to see the the, the transformation in people is is rewarding. It's just so, it's so pleasing and unto unto the Lord. Praise the Lord. Want to pray, John? Hold on, everybody. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this gracious day that you've given us. I want to thank you for. Pastor Vito is church tonight. I want to thank you for Patrick's preaching earlier. When I seen uh, Joseph uh, get get picked to come up and pray, and he came up to pray in front of the congregation, you know those are those are rewards. I mean, that's the pay. You know. I pray to you and in Jesus' name, Amen. amen. <laughs> head of the church he's the groom the church is his bride um, and if I had to be married to Jesus and the church was married to Jesus I would have to say that you know he was in love with his church you know that he would show love and mercy you know don't get me the wrong way God has a side of judgment as well but he leans towards mercy be able to live inside of me and love someone else okay that's what the church is to me you know he needs us to love our neighbor that's what he said he said that in his word the ministry's become like a family uh, and, and I'll tell you in my wildest dreams I couldn't have seen this happening all right how about Jordan way in the back Jordan you want to get up to you alone everybody you can stand right yeah hey Jordan how you doing welcome that's all Cecily's dad, right? Pardon? Cecily's dad, right? Yes. So listen, who knows Cecily? A lot of people know Cecily. Right. So Cecily will probably be coming back soon. That's Amen. that's baby, Amen. that's Becky's baby daddy. <laughs> you like that, Beck? Baby Becky daddy. Are you a Muslim? Pardon? Are you Muslim? 
Yeah, I was, I've been Muslim for a very long time. Have you? Praise I've, God. But it's been a, it's been like years since I've been in Juma. <laughs> yeah, I, I I didn't know. I just heard like rumors today, and I said, well, that's okay. I I like Muslims. You know, I like to convert them to Jesus Christ. I'll bring them over. Yeah, we converted Gollum. Look at Gollum. He was Muslim. He's still only poor. He's still only poor. You know what he said to me? He said, Assalamu alaikum. I said, You make them and I'll take them. <laughs> Are you taping this? <laughs> This is a different kind of church, isn't it? <laughs>